time and thank you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brother Amen. Scott. Amen. Thank you, buddy. If you have your Bibles, would you open with me to Nehemiah chapter 10? <laughs> Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 28 and 29. Happy Father's Day to all of you men. Good to see you here today. Hope that you're doing well. Hope that your families treat you to a stake and it's not a mistake. Some of y'all will get that in a minute. Anyway, <laughs> Nehemiah chapter 10. I want to bring a message today, a, a special message as we challenge ourselves as men. Entitled, Leadership Required. Nehemiah chapter 10, we pick up in verse 28. Now the rest of the people. The priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the Nethanim, and all those who had separated themselves from the peoples of the lands to the law of God, their wives, their sons, and their daughters, everyone who had knowledge and understanding, these joined with their brethren, their nobles, and entered into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law, which was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord our God, and his ordinances and his statutes. As we kind of launch into this, I, I love the book of Nehemiah. I love to preach verse by verse through it. And since I'm not, I've got to kind of lay the foundation for you so that we understand how God is speaking to men this morning. And so when we, we look at this and we see this passage, I want you to kind of understand what's happened. So we go back in chapter 8, and there's been a revival that takes place. The Word of God speaks in power and in might, and the people allow it to break their hearts, which causes them then to repent and desire to line up their lives with God's Word. And so there is this Revival of the word as I would call it and then the people are broken and repent and there's this great revival And when we get to, to chapter 10 the first 27 verses that we did not read Those first 27 verses are the list of the leaders of the people who sign their names to a covenant saying We are going to live in the light of this covenant that they make and we'll talk about that more in a few moments I just want to be real as we start this morning. What had occurred in the nation of Israel? They'd gotten to a bad place. They had lost the underpinning of God's word as being the very compass of their individual lives, of their religious lives, and of their community lives. They'd gotten into a mess, and they had adopted philosophies and processes and thinking that was going on with the pagan culture and the pagan world. And there comes this great revival. They were in desperate need of it. Had they not received it, who knows what would have transpired? But I want you to hear me this morning. Do you know what occurred to cause this revival to occur that brings us to this point of the text I read this morning? There was a rediscovery of the law of God. And the man of God stood and began to read and expound the word of God. That means he read it and explained it. Now listen to me very carefully. Do y'all know the law of God? <laughs> those are, that's those books that we kind of skim over and our eyes gloss over when we read. You know Leviticus, Deuteronomy. Y'all know what I'm talking about? This man stood. They're outside. And if you read the text, the people stood and listened. And for six hours, they stood outdoors, standing up to hear the word of God read and explained. And their hearts were pierced by the word of God. And in that moment when the word of God pierced them, they said, hey, when I look at my life in light of the word of God, I'm not living that standard. And they, they allowed their hearts to be broken by the word of God and they began to weep. 
And their brokenness led to repentance. And their repentance led to the desire to live differently. I think we're at a pivotal crossroads in this nation. I'm going to be honest with you. I was honest with the first service. These have been some of the most difficult days to be a pastor that I've ever lived in. And I've been doing this since I was 15. I was called at 15, pastor my first church at 18. I'll be 50 in December. It's not just me. Talk to pastors all over the same way. These are difficult days. We're at a crossroads. We've come to a place where, where life's not easy and everything is not blessing and good. And, and all of a sudden, we're, we're starting to have to deal with who are we really. But I think in the process, God is wanting to say, hold up a minute. Are you living according to my standard? Or are you living according to what you think and feel and want? And you've listened to those around you. When I was a kid, back in those days, the preachers would preach their hearts out, and many of them have gone on to glory now, and they would preach their heart out, and they would say, if America doesn't have another great awakening, she's finished. Those men have died and gone to glory. I was thinking about my pastor this week. He's gone to glory and how he would preach with passion. We've got to have a great awakening. We've got to have a revival. In my years of preaching, God's placed on my heart that we must have another great awakening. And if we don't, then this nation is in trouble. But here we are. How do we navigate? And how, do we, how do we get to that place? What we see happen with these people is that leadership is required. And let me just say this this morning. The purpose of leadership is not to get 100% of the people to agree with them. It's to lead out in the direction that is the right way to go. Some of you husbands may hear this today, and you may decide to lead out, and your wife may not follow. That doesn't mean that because she doesn't like it that it's wrong. So I want you to notice these 27 verses we didn't read, they start out and it's the leadership. So it's Nehemiah. He's the leader. He's the, he is basically, if you will, he is the physical leader in the sense of he is kind of like a government official. But his heart is hard, hard after the things of God. And then the priest sign it. And then he's followed by the Levites. And then what you have is you have the patriarchal leaders of the certain families or tribes, if you will, that they step up and they say, yes, we're going to sign this covenant. And basically, here's what they're saying in the covenant. We're, we're going to no longer live after the, the pagan examples around us. We're no longer going to compromise with what's going on with our culture. We're going to stand counterculture. We're going to stand on the word of God. We're going to live life the way God wants us to live it. And no matter what it costs us, that's how we're going to live it. And they signed this thing. And now we get to verse 28 and 29. And we're about to walk through the rest of the men that signed this covenant. And these would be the, the leaders of their own individual homes underneath the patriarchal leader of their tribes that signed it or their family lineage. So I want you to notice as we launch into leadership required this morning, notice number one, the coalition of the committed. The coalition of the committed. I want you to notice first of all their gender because it makes the whole point for the service. That we're talking about us as men. Their gender is male. How do you know that, Pastor? Well, notice what it says. Now, the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the Nethanim, and all those who'd separated themselves from the peoples of the land to the law of God with their wives, their sons, and their daughters. Well, they're men because they're husbands. They have wives. They have sons and daughters. I know that line gets blurred in our culture, but I'm sorry. It's still the husband is the man. That's a great place for an amen. Thank you, sir. So the bottom line here is, notice their, their gender. This is the male leaders of their homes. These were the men of the community that were willing to stand up and be counted for the Lord. They're saying, listen, 
We've been convicted ourselves. Our hearts have been broken by the reading of the law of God and we realize we're not living up to it. And we now want to be counted as men who will lead our homes and lead our churches and lead our, lead our communities to follow hard after the heart of God and after the word of God. Think about it. Guys, whether we like it or not, God has given men the spiritual leadership within his home, within his church, and within his community. God has uniquely crafted you, gifted you, created you to lead spiritually. And by the way, you're leading whether you realize it or not. You may read, I'll speak English in a minute, but that's all, folks. You may be leading in a wrong direction, or you may be leading in the right direction, but you're leading. And you need to hear that. And so we need to understand this is the men that were saying, I'll be willing to stand up. I want you to notice now not only their gender, but notice their grit. The Bible says all of these who were willing to separate themselves from the peoples of the land. Now, let me just say this first of all. Not all of the people, not all of the men were willing to follow this covenant. The ones that signed this, the ones that did this, these were the ones that were willing to separate themselves from the peoples of the lands. Now, let me tell you why that was a difficult thing. Because you had some of those men that in the process of time, they were Israel, they were Jews, but they intermarried with the pagan women around them and it allowed them to influence their religious process and their beliefs. And not everyone was willing to, to lay all that down and surrender all that and follow the Lord. These guys realized it was going to be costly. I want you to understand furthermore, since I didn't preach this verse by verse, I want you to understand more of the background. The culture had so infiltrated their community and their church, the temple if you will, that ladies and gentlemen, they were a mess. As a matter of fact, we read in the book of Nehemiah that one of these pagan leaders that was always opposing Nehemiah and trying to stop the work of God, he was given an inner chamber. He was given a chamber inside of the temple and he was a pagan. It wasn't a place he belonged. He shouldn't have been there. And they let him be there and they tolerated it. And so these men realized that, hey, listen, to make this commitment, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be costly. Because they had watched. They'd watched Nehemiah come in and try to lead and do what God had called him there to do. And they'd watched as, as Sanballat and Tobiah, as they came and they attacked him. And they realized if we're going to stand for God, we're going to get the same treatment he's getting. They realized that this man was powerful in the community. He held powerful sway. And they realized, man, if we make this stand, it's going to cost. But notice their grit. They didn't care. They said, we are going to separate ourselves from the culture. No longer are we going to be influenced in our decision making by the culture. We're not going to think like they think. We're not going to adapt like they adapt. We're not going to lead like they lead. We're not going to follow like they follow. We're not going to act like they act. We're not going to be motivated by what motivates them. These men said, enough. We're going to align our lives with the word of God. We're not going to be like them. And we're at a point where the world is begging for the church to be that. Be different. They don't want to look in our churches and see the same things they see out there. And these men had grit and said, we'll do it. Now I want you to notice their goal. It's found in the next part. They separated themselves from the peoples of the lands. But look what they separated themselves to. When you turn from one thing, you turn to another thing. And they separated themselves to the law of God. Here's what they said. We're going to live our lives according to the Word of God. We're going to live by the book and nothing else. If the book confronts what I'm doing, then I'm going to admit it's wrong, and I'm going to line myself back up with the book. And if the book says this is the way we're supposed to do it, then that's how we're going to do it. And these men, here's the commitment they're saying. They're saying, we're going to be men who will lead our families by the book, but it starts with them first. They're going to live their lives by the book. I'm going to talk about that more in a moment. Then they're going to lead their families by the book. And then they're going to lead their churches by the book. And then they're going to lead their communities by the book. 
And by the way, if that revival of men really were to happen in this nation, I believe we would see another great awakening. These men had allowed the word of God to penetrate and break them. And they said, no more. I'm not doing life that way. I'm tired of playing spiritual games. I'm tired of trying to sit on the fence and balance on one side appeasing God and balancing appeasing the culture or myself or my flesh on the other. I'm tired of it. I want the real thing. We move from the coalition of the committed to the coalition's clout. Look at verse 29. These joined with their brethren. Two things I want to say. Number one, I want you to understand that their leadership flowed out of their followship. Now watch this carefully. These men had been there when the word of God was read. That's great. There were other people that were there when the word of God was read, but they weren't broken. They weren't changed. Watch carefully. We live in a day in the church where I'm afraid that we're so used to the word of God that a a preacher can start to read a text and we know the story. We just kind of glaze over it. Or we can even read our Bibles and go, oh, I know this story. And we just read it and we know it. But here's the deal. We don't read it to allow the Word of God to confront us. And we'll even read it like this if we're not careful. We'll start thinking about all the other people that fits except for us. That's how sin stays hidden in our hearts. These men understood that they they couldn't lead like they were wanting to lead unless they were following like they were supposed to be following. So here's the deal. When the word of God was read during that revival, these men, here's what they're saying. God's word confronted me, and I'm not right. And when it did, they, they allowed their hearts to be broken by the word of God. And when their hearts were broken, then they repented. And when they repented, God began to produce the change in their life. Listen to me very carefully. We live in a day when the church, when when we're looking and watching people, some of you even feel this way. Well, preacher, you know, I read my Bible. I go to church. I go to Sunday school. I tithe. I do all of these good things. And and preacher, I, I just, I'm still wrestling with the same issues. I'm still stumbling over the same blocks. I'm still living in the same failures. Can, can I just be honest this morning? I think one of the reasons we struggle struggle with the lack of real changes in the church, listen, it isn't because God's lost his power and it isn't because the word of God's lost its truth. It's because we don't allow the word of God to break our hearts. And if we don't get to brokenness, we'll never get to repentance. That's why most Christians live this pattern. Oh man, God, yeah, I made a mistake and, and I, shouldn't have, I shouldn't have done those things. So God, I'm sorry. And, and, and we move on. But we're never broken. Listen to me. What you're not broken over, you'll never repent of. You may feel sorry for it in a moment, but you'll quickly get over sorrow. But if you allow the Word of God and the Spirit of God to break your heart, and you see your sin as God sees it, and your heart becomes broken, then you'll repent of it because you want to be right with Almighty God. And that's what happened with these men. When the Word of God was read... You know what blows my mind? I've studied this passage many times in my life as a pastor. It blows my mind that they were willing to stand and listen to the Word of God be read for six hours. And in the American church, people will complain about sitting over an hour in a cushion pew in air conditioning. Those are facts. You see, what these men understand is that they've got to lead their own hearts first. They can't lead anybody else's heart till they can lead their own. And they can't lead their heart because they are, they have broke, fallen flesh. And so they have to allow God to continuously, watch this word, continuously break their hearts. We never arrive at perfection. So we have to constantly admit before God, God, there's things in my life that I may not even know about that I'm blind to, but I need you to break them in my life. And when we get broken, And real repentance occurs. That's when the desires of the heart changes. 
That's when the life change occurs. And these men had experienced a life change, but their leadership flows out of their fellowship. They were willing to follow God. They were willing to follow hard after God. They were willing to surrender everything. They didn't care what it cost them. They didn't care about the pain. They didn't care who liked it or didn't like it. They realized, I'm going to stand before Almighty God one day and give an account of this. And bless God, I'm going to go if nobody else goes with me. That's the kind of leadership we need in our homes, in the church, and in our communities. But I want you to notice, secondly, their leadership not only flowed out of their fellowship, but their leadership flowed out of their fellowship. That passage says that they joined with their brethren. One of the great lies that men believe is that when God starts to deal with us, and we start to weigh the cost of what it's going to take to get where God's saying, hey, you're over here and you need to get here. Men, one of the great lies the enemy tells us is, you're all alone. Nobody else is going there. Nobody else is sacrificing that much. Nobody else is willing to pay that high of a price. Nobody else desires that. You're being, you're being overzealous. You're being too hard on yourself. But these men saw the spiritual leaders in their world, the priests and the Levites and the patriarchal leaders, they saw them saying, hey, we're going this direction. Come if you want to. And the rest of the people that were willing said, we're going with you. And these men said, yes. If you don't believe that's a great lie, all you got to do is look to the life of the prophet Elijah. Y'all remember the great victory that he won in power that God used him on Mount Carmel. And then as soon as he's won this great victory, that wicked Queen Jezebel says, I I'll have his life. He runs off in the woods and he's depressed and he's discouraged. And God says, what are you doing here? And he says, I'm the only one that's not bowed the knee to Baal. And he says, you've got to be kidding. I have thousands of men that haven't bowed the knee to Baal. You're not alone. But gang, when we think when we're alone, when we think we're the only one, that's when we start to get discouraged and the enemy starts to twist in that discouragement. Can I just say this? Men, one of the great works of the enemy is to try to divide men who are committed to the same path and cause them to think they're on different paths. If you don't believe that, look what he did with, with Paul. Paul and Barnabas, the greatest missionary team, and they got divided. Now they healed that wound, but it happened. Because the enemy wants to divide you from those who would encourage you and hold you accountable and help you in your growth, and point out areas in your life that you don't even see that are blind spiritual spots in your life. It's one of the reasons why me, we as men hate accountability. We hate it. But their leadership flowed out of their fellowship. They were being encouraged by other men who were willing to stand against the grain. They, they had other men praying for them. They had other men challenging them to take the step up and to be what they're supposed to be. They had other men who were calling them out. Thirdly, I want you to notice we move now from the coalition of the committed to the coalition's clout. We now come to the coalition's conviction. We get down to kind of what's going on here. We need to really see this, guys. So notice, there was three convictions that they maintained in this process. One is they were going to honor the covenant. They decided that they were going to follow God. And we'll talk about the covenant in a minute because they, they break it down. But I want you to notice their commitment, their conviction to honor the covenant. Verse 29, these joined with their brethren, their nobles. And watch this phrase. You need to underline it in your Bible. You just need to take a minute and underline it. And entered into a curse and an oath. Now that's strong. We don't get it in our culture, but that's strong. Here's what they did. They've made this covenant. 
and they make an oath. That means they've made a vow. They've said, God, we're going to do this. They've made a covenant vow before the Lord. Do y'all catch this picture? Now, before I go to the next part, I want you to hear something. That's a dangerous thing to do. In the Old Testament, God said, it's better for you not to make an oath to me than to break it. Because, see, God takes that very seriously. And God says, I'd rather you never make a promise to me than to lie to me. Now, let's be honest. How many of us have made vows to the Lord? Lord, if you'll just get me out of this situation, I'll do this. Lord, if you'll just heal my loved one, I'll do this. I've heard people through the years as pastors say, if God gets me out of this hospital bed, I'll be back at the church and serving him. God gets them out of the hospital bed. They come back for about three or four weeks and, and thank God. And then the next thing you know, they're gone. I've watched it. God says, don't make a vow to me and break it. You're better off not to make it. Hey, these Jewish men know, knew that teaching. They knew that was part of the word of God. And they said, no, Lord, we don't care. This is how serious we are about it. We're making a vow to you, Lord, that this is what we're going to do. But then it says this. It says a curse and an oath. Here's what that meant in Jewish life. What they've simply said is, God, if we don't keep this oath, then you can pour out your judgment upon us. You can remove your blessings. You can remove your favor from our life. And you can curse us. Whew. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I don't know many men, or women for that matter, I don't know many men that will make a vow to God and say, hey God, if I don't do this, you can remove every bit of your blessings and protection from my life. Y'all know many people that make that, that, that serious about it? But here's the truth. Listen. What these men were saying is, we're going forward with God and we're not going back. And God, if we start going back, then just stop blessing us. You pour out cursing on us. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. Do you see the difference between that and the modern American church that comes in here, living in sin and unconfessed sin and saying, God bless me. God bless my family. And these men saying, we're going to pursue the holiness of God. And if we don't, then don't bless me, curse me. Do y'all grab that? The depth of the conviction and sincerity of what they're saying? Do you know why that's important? I talked just a moment ago about why we don't see real change in our lives. We're not broken. We make excuses for our sin. We're not broken, so we don't really repent. So there's no real change. The reason is because we leave a retreat. We leave an escape route or a retreat route. Well, God, I'm going to pursue you, but just in case, I want to be able to go back. Here's what they did. They said, God, there is no retreat route. There is no escape route. I'm going forward with you. I'm not going back, and if I go back, then you remove all the blessings. You pour out your judgment on me, because God, I'd rather be judged by you than to go back to that. One of the reasons we can't move forward is because we're constantly making commitments. How many times have you been to the altar and made the same commitment to God, only to find yourself making it again later? We do it. It's because we leave a retreat. We got to burn the boats. There is no retreat, God. It's forward with you or nothing. That's what these men said. They're going to honor this covenant. Secondly, their second conviction is to honor their God. Notice what it says here. So they entered into a curse and an oath, and now we begin to look at the two parts of the covenant. The first part is to walk in God's law. To walk in God's law. It's to honor God. Here's what they're basically saying. God, we're surrendering. We're going to live a God life. 
I'm not, I'm not going to live my rights, my wants, my choices, my demands, my thoughts. I'm not going to live the culture's thoughts and the culture's demands. God, I'm going to live God's life. It's the idea that we have in the New Testament where we're to die to self and it's no longer I who lives but Christ who lives. It's the idea of Romans 12, 1, that we're to present ourselves a living sacrifice. That means I'm dead to me. These men have said, God, we want to honor you with our lives. We want everything about our life to be in alignment with your word so that what comes out of my life honors you. I'm dying to all my wants and all my rights and all my demands and all my dreams. And, and I'm dying to me. I'm dying to I. How many of you have understood in the Christian life that I and Christ can't coexist in my life? It can't. And so here they're saying, Lord, you can curse us if we don't honor the fact that we're going to honor you with our lives. That word walk. In the Hebrew means to live or behave in a certain manner. What they've basically just said is we're going to live and behave. Our life choices, our life actions, our character is going to reflect the book. Our life is going to reflect God. So when people see everything about us, then they're going to see God. Now, here's one of the problems in the modern church of America. Hear me carefully, men. We in the church as men have been taught this basic thought. Well, you know, as long as you don't, as long as you don't smoke, drink, watch porn, cheat on your wife, you go to church, you're a good man. Ladies and gentlemen, I know lost people who don't smoke, drink, watch porn, and they're committed to their wife. See, the Pharisees were good at that. The outside stuff that everybody could see, Jesus said on the outside, you're whitewashed, you got it perfected, but inside, you're full of dead men's bones. You see, God's looking at the inside of my heart and your heart. God sees it all. And these men understand that. They've come to that place, they know it, and they're like, God! I don't want to just look like an Israelite. I don't want to just look like an Old Testament saint. I don't want to just look like a church person. I don't want to just look like a New Testament saint. I want to be. Y'all see the difference? We bought that lie and God has said, no. You can line all those things up on the outside and the inside can be wrong. And we do that in the church. We excuse what we call our little sins and think it's not a big deal. And we're constantly looking at these big sins. And as long as we keep awake, by the way, there's no big and little sins. They're all in the front to a holy God. But that's what we do. And we think as long as I'm staying away from those, I'm good with God. And God says, no, we're not. Ladies and gentlemen, to live, to behave in a manner that is honoring to God, that's what they've made an oath to do. And they've said, if we go back on it, curse us. There's a third conviction, and it's to honor God's word. Look at the last part. They're going to walk in God's law, which was given by Moses, the servant of God. Now watch the second part of the covenant. To observe and do all the commandments of the Lord our God, his ordinances and his statutes. Basically, everything God says, his commandments, his teachings, his principles. We're, we're going to honor the word of God and live according to it. But I want you to notice that word there, observe. It's a powerful word. This word, observe. It means to, to keep watch, to guard, to protect, to keep oneself. It literally means to cause a certain state or condition to remain. And it's tied to their covenant. They're saying, hey, we've said that we've made an oath and a curse to God. And we're going to honor God with our lives. We're going to live it. And the way we're going to live it is we're going to honor the Word of God. And we're going to keep our hearts soft to the Word of God. And we're going to stay broken when the Word of God speaks. And we're going to let it speak to us. And we're going to repent when God reveals it. And we're going to start reading the Word of God like this. God, how do you want me to think? How do you want me to act? 
How do you want me to do? How am I supposed to be in this relationship? And God, I am going to protect my walk. I'm going to protect my choices so that I stay in this state of surrender and obedience to you. That's so different than what we see so often, even in the church. Often we'll see folks say, oh, I want this and I'm going to do this. But we go right back. And if we're honest, we didn't let the Word of God keep speaking to us and break us and we made excuses because we looked at everybody else and we said well I'm better than them and we've we've minimized our sin hear me for years we've talked about that the American church needs revival it's always it's always bothered me that God's prescription for revival has never changed we even quote it all the time, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people which are called by my name will humble themselves, repent, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and heal their land. We quote it, but it never happens. Why does it never happen? Because we think God meant for them out there to do it. Well, look at all their sins, preacher, and we talk about their sins. But God, not worried about their sins because they don't know him. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. This is a powerful truth if you'll grasp it. But God has already said that the power of revival is in the heart of his people. If my people will get serious and repent. See, when we get get like they were, all of a sudden we start to realize that my sin is not just some little stuff. See, when we get broken before God, the Bible said in that verse, 2 Chronicles seven fourteen, turn from your mistakes. It says wicked ways. David said, search me and try me, O Lord, and see if there be any wickedness in me. See, when a man gets broken, he doesn't parse verbs. He says, God, this thing that I've tolerated is wickedness before holy God and it's keeping me from what you want for my life and it's keeping my family from being what you want them to be and it's keeping my church from being what you want it to be and it's keeping my community from being what you want it to be God I'm wicked you see if we'll ever see that what we think is little sin is actually keeping us off the path and it's causing people to follow us off the trail and we'll start to realize how wicked what we call little sin really is men listen to me The reason God calls us to be this humble and this broken is because people are watching us. Your children are watching you. And if you start to go off the trail, they're going to go, well, well, daddy goes to church and he's a Christian. That must be the way to go. And they'll follow you right off the cliff. People in the church are watching you. And they'll follow you right off the cliff. People in our community... They know you go to church. They'll they'll say, well, that must be how you do it, and they'll follow you right off the trail. Gang, do you see why God calls it wickedness? These men said, no, God, we're going to keep watch over our lives. We're going to stay soft. We're going to stay humble. We're going to stay broken. And when you show us stuff in our lives, we're going to repent. I want to close with a challenge to us men. You'll be hearing more about this in the coming days, but we're issuing what we're calling man challenge. It's about really being biblical, godly men. You'll hear some about it here now. You'll hear some about it next Sunday. And then you'll be hearing about a few weeks beyond that that we're going to have a special time on a Sunday evening when we're asking all of our men to come, bring your chairs outside, and bring your Bible. And God's going to speak to us. But for this week, will you draw a circle around yourself? And say, God, search me. Listen, 
Listen, I know how we operate. I'm one of you. I'm a man too. When you draw that circle, there's nobody in the circle but you and God. You know what we men like to do? We've been doing it ever since. We've been doing it ever since Adam. But God, that person, oh, whoa, whoa, that person's not in the circle. But, but, but my parents, you don't understand how, they're not in the circle. Y'all know we do it. How many times have you thought, I'd be a better person if she was nicer? How many of you women would say, I'd be a better Christian if he would just pick his clothes up and take the trash out? But can I tell you, you're not going to stand before the Lord with your spouse. You're going to stand alone. You're not going to stand with your children. Your children, you aren't going to stand with your parents. You're going to stand alone. So, so God is saying to us men, this week, here's what we want to do. We want to draw a circle around ourselves. And here's, it's just me and you, Lord. Search me, not them. Search me, God. Search me. If there's any wickedness in me, anything that's not pleasing to you, by the way, anything that's contrary to the words wickedness, God, show me. You know, God, I know I got spiritual blind spots. There's things in my life I don't even see, God. Show them to me. God, I've, I've held on to some things because I didn't think they were that bad. God, would you break my heart over them? God, I'm drawing a circle around me. God, show me what's in me. And don't you step in that circle and say, I'm right with God. Because you know what? We'll say, well, I, 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 my heart's right. Really? Scripture tells me my heart will deceive me. It'll deceive yours too. See, the only thing I can trust is God. God, you're going to have to show it to me. And God, here's what I'm asking you. When you reveal it, God, break my heart over it. Take away my excuses. Take away my defenses. And break my heart so I can repent over it. So that I can get to where you want me to get to. Because God, till I get where you want me, my family cannot get where you want them. So God, get me where you want me. I'm challenging us men. Draw the circle this week. And all week, just lay before God and ask that question. And beg God to break you. And bring you to repentance. That's what I'm asking him for me. Because I want my family to go where God wants it to go. I want our church to go where God wants it to go. I want our community to go where God wants it to go. These men understood that spiritual leadership is required to get the people of God where God wants them to go. And it's not starting with the big group. It's starting with one. Each individual spiritual leader getting right. And when we get right, then we start to lead our family right. And when that family gets right, then we connect with all the other families that are getting right because their daddies are right. And then all of a sudden, the next thing you know is the church is right. And when the church gets right and other churches get right, then the churches come together and we see Second Chronicles 7, 14. And then the community gets right because God heals the land. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, leadership is definitely required. God, I'm asking you right now, first of all, to speak to some men who are listening to this here in person and some that are listening on the Internet who don't know you. God, the first thing they need to do is come to you and be born again. So, God, I pray that you would speak and that by the power of your Spirit, people would be saved right now. And now, God, I pray for all of us as men. God, I'm drawing the circle. It's just me and you. Search me and try me. Show me and break my heart. That I might repent and allow you to change me. That I'm living a God life. 
so that I can be what you want me to be. So that I can lead my family to be what you want them to be. So that the church can become what you want the church to be. So that the community can become what you want the community to be. But it starts with me inside this circle. God, it's my prayer, but I pray it would be the prayer of every man in this room right now. And God, we wouldn't just walk away today and forget it, but all week, we just take some time and draw the circle and say, God, show me. Because God, we're going to need you to do that every day of our life, to point it out so that we stay soft, so that we stay broken over the littlest things, so that we don't become hard and calloused. So Lord, right now in Jesus' name, would you speak and do a work in the men's lives. And I pray that we'll make a commitment today that we're going to be men who want to live God lives with no retreat. Be glorified and honored in our response now in Jesus' name. Amen. Right now, I'm just going to ask you, I know these are different times, but I'm going to ask you if you would just Make that pew arm in front of you. Your Friend, I want to thank you for joining us today for worship at Hopewell Baptist Church. And perhaps today, during this message, God spoke to your heart, and you would think to yourself right now, Scott, I, I really would like to have a relationship with this God that you've talked about. I want to know that my sins are forgiven, and that this Jesus that you've talked about today is my Lord and my Savior. Well, friend, you can. The Bible says very clearly, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible says if you'll confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Friend, I want to lead us in a time of prayer right now. You can repeat these words after me. There's nothing magical about the words that I'm about to speak. They simply have to be the cry of your heart to God. And God is listening and will hear your words and will forgive your sins and to save your soul. Would you just right there where you are, repeat this prayer with me if that's what God's speaking to your heart right now. You just pray something like this. Dear God, I am so sorry. I know that I have rebelled against you and lived life my own way and not cared about you or your authority over my life. I know your word calls that sin, and I am so sorry. God, I ask you right now to forgive me of my sins and to save my soul based on what your son Jesus Christ did for me by taking my punishment on the cross and by rising again three days later to seal my victory. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for taking my punishment on the cross. Thank you for rising again to seal my victory. And Lord, right now, as best I know how, I give you my life to live for you all the days that I have left. In Jesus' name, amen. Friend, if you prayed that prayer right there, I want you to know that God has forgiven you he has saved you. The Bible says He has written your name down in the Lamb's book of life. He has adopted you into His family. And right now, I want you to share that good news with us so that we can rejoice with you and encourage you in your newfound journey of faith. Right now, if you are watching me, there is in this corner, uh, there is a QR code. If you would take your phone and put the camera up to it, it's going to open up a dialogue box. And if you would just fill that out and send it in, when you do, it goes to our pastors and they will respond back to you. Please give us your email phone number so that we can get back in touch with you. If you happen to be watching on our website, this dialog box is just beneath me here if you'll scroll down and fill that out. And so if you happen to be on YouTube on your phone right now and say, well, I, I can't take a picture with my phone, if you will just open up the information box below that, the description box, there's a link there that you can click. Once you click that, it's going to open the same dialog box. When it does, it gives you three choices. The first one says, today I prayed to receive Christ saved. 
That's what you did. Would you check that box and then fill out the information? Maybe you joined us today and you'd say, Scott, I'm a believer. I've given my heart and life to Christ, but I've got some things I need help with or encouragement with. I need you to pray with me about some stuff, or I have some spiritual or physical needs that I need the church to help me with. You can do the same thing when that dialogue box opens up. There's two other boxes that you could check. One says prayer request. One says needs. You check the appropriate box. Give us the information. And again, our pastors will be back in touch with you. Friend, again, thank you so much for joining us today in worship. We at Hopewell, we love you. We're praying for you. And we hope to see you here live on campus with us one day real soon. God bless now.